Amen. Amen. All right. What's up? Y'all look so good. Okay. So if you know just a little bit about me, you know that, one, I can talk like a lot, but I'm going to keep it down. Okay. But here's the other thing is I like it when someone kind of talks back to me in a respectful way. And so we're going to practice a little something. Because as I'm talking to you today, there may be something that I hope God stirs in you, and I would love to hear about it. So this is how I want you to kind of talk back to me. Because the church I was raised in, I mean, they were talking all the time, right? And my mom's here, so she can attest to that. And so, yeah, I know. Give it up for mom. What? And so... Um, here's how we're going to practice. When I say something that's really good, I need you to say something like, all right. Or I need you to say something like, okay. Or you can even say, you know, sometimes I say something like, come through, right? Because I'm like telling Jesus, like, come on, just, just bring it through, right? And so we're going to practice. So pretend that I've said something really good how are you going to respond? Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so here's what I need you to do. I need you to think, who likes Chick-fil-A? And y'all know Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, right? I need you to talk back to me like Chick-fil-A opened up on Sunday just for you. Won't he do it? Come on. That's what I need you to do. Okay, I think y'all are ready. Are you ready? All right, let's pray. I know we've prayed, but, you know, we can always pray a little bit more. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity to stand before each and every person here, but also to be your instrument. Lord, decrease me so that you might increase and let everything I do and say be pleasing to you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm kind of a little storyteller, so we're going to talk about a couple stories. One is going to be about a shepherd, one is going to be from a prisoner, and then one, I'm going to get a little personal and talk about me, okay? So the first story comes in 1 Samuel. And we are coming into a time when King Saul is ruling. And let me tell you, during his reign, th they were always fighting with the Palestines. Like, there's not a time they were not in conflict. And so we're coming in, though, on a time when the Palestines got, I mean, they kind of got something in their arsenal called Goliath. And as I read the Bible and I look at different commentaries, it tells me that Goliath was a big man. Like, not like six foot tall man, like the Bible says nine foot tall. Right. He had armor from head to toe. He has a sword that was heavier than anyone can lift. And this man was walking out of the Palestine army, coming up to Saul's army and saying, what you going to do? Like this, I mean, I'll take on any of y'all. Just one. Just one stand up. Be brave enough to take me on. And here's what we're going to do. If anyone beats me, we will then follow you. But here's what's not going to happen. <laughs> Nobody's going to beat me. Right? He had confidence like no other. And so, anyway, so, okay, so that's setting the scene. Then we have this wee lad, right? And it was young David. And David had three brothers. And the brothers were taller in stature. The brothers kind of carried themselves in a way to where they actually were a part of the army. Well, one day, well, but David was not a part of the army because as the Bible describes him, he was a little smaller in stature. And so no one was recruiting him to be part of the army. But he had gifts. Matter of fact, when this took place, it was spoke over him that he would be king. 
So, but, you know, they're like, eh. I mean, look at my brothers. What? They just didn't believe it. But David had a father that was amazing, right? And believed in him and said, you know what, David? I haven't heard from your brothers. Why don't you go check on them? And again, I'm kind of telling this how it made real to me because the Bible's alive. So it becomes real to you. He said, why don't you go check on your brothers? And here's the thing. David said, okay. Here's my thing. If we're in war and I know that my brothers may be fighting and my dad tells me to go to the front lines and talk to my brothers, guess what? I probably wouldn't have gone because that's a scary place to be. And so anyway, David went, he was obedient, he was talking to his brothers, and at that time that he was talking to his brothers, guess who comes out of the opposing camp? Goliath. Goliath comes out just like he did for the last 40 days. Can you imagine that? For 40 days, someone is intimidating you, coming forth and daring you to fight them. He comes forth, he issues this petition, just like he had for the last 40 days, and the only difference this time is David was there. And as he's issuing this demand, and David's looking around, he's realizing that no one's taking him up on the offer. And David, the one that loves the Lord, then said to his brother, like, is no one going to step up? Like, are you not the army of the living God? Like, why are y'all here? And I think for us, just to pause the story just a minute, for us sometimes when we go through battles in life, we fight them from a place of defense when really we should be fighting from a place of offense because we serve a God that is already won. But we forget that. We forget that in the end we win. I've read the end of the Bible. We win. I've read the end of that book. And so David then, going back to the story, says, okay, well, if y'all not going to fight him, I'm going to fight him. Now, by this time, his brother is, like, mad. Like, why are you here? Don't you have a shepherd to keep? I mean, like, a sheep to keep? Like, what are you doing in my space? That's like somebody that has actually been there for a while, all of a sudden step into your space, and you're like, why are you here? But David's thing is, obviously I'm here to do something that God has called me to do. And so David then begins thinking of a plan. And maybe sometimes when we face things, we need to step back and think of a plan. So he sat back, he thought of a plan, and he decided that he is actually going to come off as very weak to the giant and actually play a little fool tactic, right? If I show him I'm very weak, that I'm real scared, right, it's going to catch him off guard. And guess what? It worked. So David, from a distance, if you'll put up that picture, from a distance, David begins coming across like he, you know, like this, look at the size of those two. He came coming across to this giant, and the giant started laughing at him. There are some times that we go through stuff that we sometimes feel like the situation that we're in is laughing back at us. I've been there. Maybe you haven't. And it's like it keeps going and going and going. And so in that, in his tactic, he wanted to deflect him, show him that he's really weak. Even though David has said, you know, I've defeated wolves. 
all of those kind of come for my sheep, right? He just has this courage. But here's the other thing he has. He has faith. That if God has sent him to it, God will take him through it. Some of y'all, me included, forget that if God brought me to it, he's going to bring me through it. And it may not look the way I want it to look, but I will be victorious. So just kind of wrapping up that story. So he caught him off guard. He's up here pretending like he's weak. The giant's not even paying him any attention. Like, you're not even an opponent. Like, I'm not even worried about you. Like, I, I'm not even going to draw. I mean, like, I'm here. David got close enough because what the giant didn't see, all he saw was a staff, like what a shepherd would typically have. But what he didn't see that he had hidden was his bag and three smooth stones. And as he got close, he also had a slingshot. As he got close, he aimed, he fired, and he hit him in the forehead. And it knocked him over. Well, first of all, anytime you knock over something that's nine feet tall, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of rumbling. And then plus, if you're nine feet tall, you're not thinking anyone's going to knock you over. So he was probably on the ground thinking, like, what is going on? But David sees the opportunity. And he took care of the giant. I won't go into the bloody details of what he did, but I implore you to dive into your own Bible and check it out. So that's one story, right? And we're talking about faith. We're talking about the fact that someone saw something that was insurmountable, and even though he did not feel fully equipped, he knew because God gave him the plan he would be victorious. There are going to be storms that you go through. There are going to be things that you go through. And you're going to have to see it through even if you can't see the end. Even if you can't see how it's going to end up, you are going to have to be obedient like David was. And you're going to have to go through it. Sometimes it's not pretty. Most times it's not pretty. But you have to do it. You have to learn to fight like David fought with faith, knowing that God is going to take you through it. So now let's go to another story. Let's go to Philippians, first chapter. And the little context to this story is that you have someone named Paul that has been imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And they figured if they threw him in prison, that will stop everything he's doing. And those people that really saw Paul as competition was like, this is my opportunity to get up and do what I do best. Because there for a while, everybody was listening to Paul. But here's what they did not realize. When Paul was in prison... Paul had a mindset not around his circumstances, but in a hope of a God that was going to take him through that. And so I want to read directly out of the Bible some of the things that Paul said when he was in prison. And he says this, in verses 27 through 30, Paul was sharing some advice and he said, meanwhile, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on to whether I come or not. Your conduct may be the same whether I show up to see things for myself or hear it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust the good news, not flinching, 
not dodging in the slightest way before your opposition. Your courage and your unity will show them what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. Far more to his life than trusting in Christ, there's also suffering in him. And the suffering is as much a gift as the trusting. You're involved in the same type of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an updated report through this letter. Can you imagine being in a prison and where most people will feel there is no hope, he found hope. Not only hope in his situation, but he also found a platform to preach God's word to anybody that would listen. Because guess what? Now they're a captive audience. And they hear all about this God that he's been preaching about. Paul did not allow his circumstances to dictate whether or not he was going to serve a living God. Because to him, if he lived, he still was going to be the messenger of God. If he died, it was going to be a prize. Because he knew where he was going. And he knew the Savior that was walking through him. So I want to ask you a question. When you are faced with tough situations, do you fight like David with faith? Do you proclaim God's word like Paul? Or do you take a complete step back? Now, don't get me wrong. Stepping back is not a bad thing. Sometimes you have to step back in order to come up with a plan. That's what David did. But are you stepping back so long that you're now out of the game? Because some of y'all are fighting fights that you were never meant to fight. Some of y'all are fighting with weapons that will never stand. The only weapons that will stand is the ones that are given to us by God. So who are you fighting? Before I send you out and tell you to have this slingshot with your stones and be ready to knock down your giants, who are you fighting? Have you figured it out? Because in the beginning, his brothers were mad at him. He could have turned around and he could have started fighting them because they were mad and saying stuff and asking why he's even there. But he kept focused to what he was doing. And what God has called him to do. Do you stay focused or do you get distracted? I get distracted sometimes. Maybe you won't admit it, but I do. I get distracted from what God has called me to do. But you have to look forward. And you have to face that giant head on. But you have to recognize who your giant is. And regardless of what happens in your life, you have to give God the glory. Because remember, if he brings you to it, he's going to bring you through it. So, okay, come on. Look at y'all talking back. Okay, so let me take you. If some of y'all were actually in chapel last year, you heard a little bit of my story. The way I'm going to kind of end is I'm going to talk a little bit about my story. And if you would bring that up. Three years ago, I was faced with a battle that I needed to fight. I was faced with a trauma in my life that almost ended my life. For the first three days, my family did not even know if I was going to make it. My sons that live out of state, one of them was not even allowed to come in until we figured out what my prognosis was going to be. Let me tell you, I should not be walking this stage today. I should not even be here. 
Because to face what I had to face, people don't live through it. But let me tell you, when I moved from the place of why me to why not me, my mental battle changed. It was no longer taking energy from me, trying to figure out why me. It switched to being able to gear up and have faith and fight because it happened to me. So I had to make a mental transition from why not me, from why me to why not me. But here's what I'm here to tell you. There are some days that I'm like, Jesus, can we talk? Could we not have found another way? But here's what I need you to know. At the end of the day, I count it all joy. Because I'm stepping in places that I never would have been able to step in before because I didn't have the right perspective. There are so many of you that are walking through hard times. There are so many of you that deal with battles every day. But here's what I want to ask you. What's your perspective? If you're fighting in a place where you're thinking, I'm just going to get through it, guess what? You're not fighting with faith. If you're fighting from a place of woe is me and you're caught in this place of why is this happening, you're not going to have the tools you need to really fight. Let me tell you how I got through it. One way is I asked for help. And let me tell you, somebody that had been living her entire life very independent, my mother can attest to this, <laughs> and even she would ask me what's going on, I got it, I got it, I'm good, I got it, <laughs> I'll handle it, okay, I'll make it happen, to being at a place where I had to ask for help. Because here's what was the reality for me. At the, at the early part of my recovery, I could not even turn over in the bed by myself. My husband had to roll me in the bed. At my lowest point of recovery, I could only get into two rooms in my house because I was in a wheelchair. And those two rooms did not involve a kitchen which if you know me, I'm from the South, and I love to eat, and that's a problem. Okay, that was funny. Why did y'all not laugh? Do y'all not like to eat? Okay, okay, right, right. So it wasn't the kitchen that I can get in, right? It was my bedroom that had a bathroom and a living room. Those were the two places that I was for three months of my life. I couldn't drive for almost six months of my life. The only way I survived is asking for help. If you are walking through something, I need you to know there is no shame in asking for help. At SNU, there are so many people that want to surround you with love and support but they don't want to crowd you, but it's okay to ask for help. I had to. And so as I continue to walk in this journey of recovery, there's three things that I realized. Is that when I come across battles and I need to fight, I fight with faith. When I get to a place where it's either curse God or praise God, I praise him. And it's not a simple journey sometimes when you're walking through something really hard. You may have walked through something really hard. And you're just like, I don't know where God was. I'm here to tell you he never left you. And he never will. He's just waiting for you to step into it. 
If God hasn't walked through that door, did you lock it? And say, I got it? What does that look like in your life? If nothing else, I believe that God walked me through what he walked me through, not just for me, but today for each of you. Because now I have a boldness. I mean, I was kind of sassy before, but I have a boldness that I will tell anybody what God has brought me through. Will you? It's not jokes. It's not games. It's real. Where are you at? One other thing that got me through was worship. It's real important to me. And so as we end today, I have asked the band to come back. And they are going to play a song that I wouldn't say is my theme song. But if you had to choose a song that I came out with, like even with like a little walk, right, this would be my song. And so I hope you enjoy it. But I need you to know, hear the words. Hear the words. Because it wraps up to everything we just talked about. All right.